Uh, this is John Braga. Um, I've been asked to do this presentation on the tree and shrub mortality in Joaquin Miller Park. Um, this has been a team effort with Karen Paulsel, and I've been working with her and Jay Cassiani to track and quantify the tree and shrub mortality in Joaquin Miller Park. To notice trees being distressed back in June, um, then in July, August, shrubs started declining as well. And, um, and for a while, I thought it was just drought stress, but by November, it was clear that the disease was also a factor and was affecting large areas of the park. So I, I put together a series of before and after images of some of the affected areas in the park. Uh, the before images I took from Google Earth um, and date and they're, they're dated about September 2018. Uh, the after pictures were all taken in mid-January and most of them using a drone. Um, so this is a before picture of the Sequoia Bayview Trail area. Up here is uh, the horse arena. And so this is 2018. Um, and that's what this same area looks like today. Here's the horse arena up here. Um, and this is uh, mostly acacias, some odd types of eucalyptus. Um, and this is uh, probably the largest or second largest area, but there are several other pretty large areas right around here, uh, also on the Sequoia Baby Trail. There are several known pathogens that are exacerbated by drought um, that becomes strong when the trees are weakened by drought. Um, but there may be something new in play as well um, because there's a common set of symptoms uh, among some of these plants. Um, there are top people working on it um, at Berkeley Davis USDA and the US Forest Service, um, but that search is like looking for needles in a haystack and, uh, and it could take a little while. Um, there are top people working on it um, at Berkeley Davis USDA and the US Forest Service, um, but that search is like looking for needles in a haystack and, uh, and it could take a little while. Um, I won't go through the list of trees and shrubs. I can leave this for you to look at at your own leisure. Um, I would just note that if if it were only acacias and eucalyptus and French broom that were being affected, I think a lot of people would go, okay, our job is done here. Um, but in fact, there are actually more native species that are being um, that are being affected than there are invasives. Um, and we've got several more trees and shrubs on the, on the watch list. Um, so I personally started noticing stuff happening in June of 2020, although the infection was almost certainly you know, going long before that. Um, early on, the acacias and pines were the most obviously affected because they because they were really bright. You, know, you could see them easily while the eucalyptus and the other trees was, it wasn't as obvious. Um, large areas were already dying by the end of November and the pace of decline has been very noticeable. Some changes that you would expect to happen over months have instead occurred within weeks or even days. Um, we've, we're getting some rain now in January and we'll be watching carefully to see what effects the rain will have. Um, Smart Money says that uh, that some plants will improve dramatically with the rain and some will, uh, will decline dramatically because of the rain, um, uh, because the rain may help the, uh, the infections more than it helps the plants. Um, and what happens next remains to be seen. Uh, you know, give us another three months or so, and we'll see what what happens uh, in spring. Um, if we get enough rain uh, over the winter, we may see some real improvements. 
Um, if we don't, it's likely that we're going to see a lot of acres of dead vegetation up in Walking Miller Park and down into the South Loop Creek watershed. Um, Fosk really doesn't have the resources to do anything about the die-off, but, um, but after things have sort of run their course, um, the organization could play a key role in planning and facilitating recovery efforts and replanting and so forth and so on. And that's what I have for today. Thanks for listening.